This presentation is brought to you by the SDG Decision Education Center. Hello, and welcome to our webinar today, Beyond Decision Rights, What Most Decision Processes Get Wrong. I'm Lynn Slattery, Director at UT in the Executive Education Program, where I work through a program of open enrollment classes, and part of that being our portfolio of strategic decision and risk management classes. For this series of classes, we partner with SDG, and this brings together decades of experience of research, teaching, and consulting to bring you the best and most applicable program we possibly can to help you with your decisions. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Carl Spetzler is author and consultant with more than 40 years of experience working with top management and boards to make great decisions. He is the author of the 2016 book, Decision Quality, and a lead instructor in several of the classes in the Strategic Decision and Risk Management Portfolio. Carl is the Chairman and CEO of Strategic Decision Group. Carl, welcome to today's webinar. My pleasure. With Carl today is Jennifer Meyer. She is consultant and educator at SDG. She routinely works with corporate leaders and strategy project teams to develop business strategies to meet corporate growth goals. She also works to put in place practices and processes that foster a healthy decision quality and culture. Jennifer is an experienced educator who has developed and delivered several classes in the SDRM program as well. With Carl, she is co-author of Decision Quality. Jennifer, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you, Lynn. Pleasure to be here. Thank you both for being here. Carl, I'm going to turn the floor over to you to get started. Thank you very much, Lynn. So our agenda today has the following storyline. There are two flaws that uh, end up making collaborative cross-organizational decision processes very frustrating. And they are the use of the advocacy approval process that actually builds in all kinds of distortions and biases, and then the lack of clear roles to demand and deliver decision quality, uh, which generally what people mean with uh, decision rights, they mean the power to make the choice as opposed to uh, assuring and making sure that the quality is built into the decision. So uh, what's missing is that the designation of a decision executive that has the understanding and insists on decision quality and a qualified decision project leader, let's call him, who can assure that the decision executive actually gets that. The constant for all these decisions is getting to decision quality, and therefore you have to have the designated roles to be responsible for that. And all of that has to be in the done in the context of reality of real decision making, uh, so that you have to diagnose the decisions and do what's right for purpose in terms of fit for purpose kind of processes and roles. That's our storyline for today. And let me start with talking about the underlying issue of what we call the typical advocacy approval process that doesn't, doesn't generate decision quality. Most of you have experienced that of being in front of a decision body, it could be one person or a number, that you know will ultimately make the decision and you have to sell them on something. Uh, or you've been on the other side as a decision maker and you get to be the one that's, that's the interrogator that uh, kind of pokes the presenter on and asks tough questions uh, to see. And actually the tough questions aren't necessarily uh, only for the purpose of content. They may very well be for figuring out how deep has this team gone before I build uh, my trust in their recommendation. So it's kind of a, uh, from the top down, a questioning. So there are two, two parts to this. One is the, the top line here is the deciders, and it could be one person or it could be a number of them together. And then there is some kind of project team on, on, on significant decisions, the bigger decisions, and they work the problem they develop a recommendation, they then bring it back, and it's an advocacy approach. They have to sell their recommendation to the deciders. And if the deciders agree and say, okay, we approve, they go forward. And if they say no, then it's a recycle. Okay? And 
uh, it may be a recycle or it may be a, a definite no, but more often than not, it's going back and having to do something else. Okay? In that setting, uh, what the decider wants to do is to be uh, assured that what they are agreeing to has integrity, is makes sense, is quality. It's not going to end up coming apart later on. And as a decider, you get very good at uh, this interrogating and uh, some do it with a very intensive uh, approach and make the presenter very uncomfortable, uh, often with the purpose of instilling some fear. And this fear then is seen as making the project team work super hard to close all kinds of holes ahead of time. Okay, so it's kind of like, if I'm going to go in front of this interrogation, I better have my story straight. I better have all the backup slides. Uh, there are different settings. In some places, the whole project team gets to sit on the, on the side of, uh, on, on, in chairs and are there in case there's a subject matter expertise question that's going to be asked. But in other cases, only the, the project team leader is, is, is coming in. But the process of interrogation and presenting is the same. From below, uh, in, in, term, in this chart, where you're doing the selling, it is a very intense kind of environment. Okay? So uh, it depends a lot on your personal capability and style. So extroverts often have an advantage in this of being fast on the on the uh, response. Introverts who like to think before they talk, uh, that delay is often seen like maybe they don't know, but they're just being thoughtful in their response. So style matters uh, and every organization is somewhat different of how much you have to send ahead of time and how much you have to do after. But the basic process is one of selling. So what it does is it creates an environment where there are a lot of biases built in. First of all, there are no alternatives. Why are there no alternatives? Or if there are, they're bad ones. Kissinger used to say that when he'd ask for uh, alternatives and options from the State Department, that he, they'd give him all out nuclear war, abject surrender, or what we're proposing. Okay, and so uh, people will come up with what we call decoys that are really not very meaningful competitors to the one recommendation you want to have accepted. Uh, really significantly good competitors to the strategy or the decision or recommendation are actually an enemy to the person that's trying to make the sale. So you're going to you're going to bolster the alternative that you want to recommend, and you're going to find all kinds of evidence uh, that will help you selectively uh, reduce alternatives that in fact the deciders might throw at you and say, why aren't we considering this? Why aren't we doing that, etc. Uh, in that setting, uh, confirming evidence bias runs rampant, uh, selective attention, it runs almost every bias starts feeding into this, okay? okay. And so what you get is really a, a, a setting where the, uh, the sale is not necessarily what would be the best choice. It is the choice that has been fortified. Now this game is played so effectively and so well and everybody knows it and assumes it's the way things should be done, that uh, people aren't even aware of it. They believe that this is the right way to make decisions and the advocacy approval process tends to be the dominant decision process in most organizations that I'm familiar with. And it goes very deep because everybody has learned how to play this game. So. If you're a decider, this is the way, you know how to do this well. 
And somebody trying to change the game on you isn't necessarily the thing you want to do. You've learned to play basketball, and somebody's asking you to play football today, okay? And perform. No, that won't be so easy. The same thing from the decision project team side. They are in the business of trying to make that sale and everything works towards that meeting and how we have it uh, ready to go. And when you come out of that meeting, the big question is, did you win or not? It's a win-lose situation and it's a competition among people. Carl, and we talked about this even I mean, as being so much uh, a combination of all these different biases and problems, this is even something that we think about as one of our mega biases that we describe in the DQ book. It's, it's one of those things that, is, that wraps together so many different problems and it's so prevalent. We actually describe it as one of these mega biases. Right, right. And we, we describe uh, five mega biases in the book. We have now up to six. So if you come to the course and biases, you're going to get six, one extra. Uh, but so this process is in, uh, deeply embedded. And now let's turn and talk a little bit about how people go about roles and definitions. And to, before we go into that, we'd like to know where you are on uh, that in your organization. Thank you very much, Carl. And on your screens, you will see a quick poll. And all you need to do with your mouse is just select one of the radio dials against either strongly agree, agree, neither agree or disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. And remember to click submit at the bottom. Wow, you're all really fast. I can see that we've already got nearly 70% of you have voted. And we just give you another moment and then we will close the poll and share the results with you all. Yeah. So this is really the statement of, is this the primary process for making important decisions in your organizations? I hope you all recognize it from my description. Okay, so uh, it is certainly among the, if I take together strongly agree and agree, we're up in that 80% plus mode, okay? And uh, that goes with our experience of seeing this deeply embedded in organizations. Now, even organizations that attempt to have uh, decision quality as an organizational competence, I see still struggling with this. And I want to make one thing clear as we go in talking about how people reinforce this. Uh, the, uh, and let's go to the next slide at this point. Uh, <clears throat> the traditional roles that people have in decision making don't solve this fundamental flaw of the advocacy approval process. And there are many uh, acronyms that you may have heard for decision roles. Uh, some of them uh, that are most commonly known uh, are RACI and RAPID. The RACI stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed. It's applied not just to decision making, but also to tasks. So people try to say, okay, what's having clear role definition in those? RAPID, uh, which came from Bain, uh, uses recommend, agree, perform, input, and decide. And all of these and other role designations are really accepting the frame of the advocacy approval process as being the primary process. Now, in the real world of making decisions and getting approvals, we're not going to uh, end up uh, eliminating advocacy approval. In fact, if you think of a board of directors and their responsibility and duty of care, they have to uh, go and uh, in essence approve an awful lot of things that they can't go through at the level of detail where they know for sure that the recommendation has decision quality. So they're, they're in an inspection approval mode. And so this kind of process will still have to be around. The big thing we shouldn't confuse with it though, is that the advocacy approval process does not give us decision quality. 
you won't get it out of the advocacy approval process. So that by the time you get into recommendation advocacy mode, it has to have decision quality. So there has to be a role that for that advocacy approval process pre the decision uh, or pre the recommendation that assures that we have decision quality. And these many variants, by the way, are well explained in Wikipedia. You can see it here. And uh, for rapid on the next page, this is the vein, the one that was popularized. But you can see as you go through, it's more about decision rights and, and who can make the call and who has to do what in that, which is all advocacy approval mindset. And so let's talk about what we should do uh, instead. But before we go there, I'd have another poll here just to see how many organizations that are online here use the designated roles that are in the RACI, RACI and RAPID. Okay, so please answer the poll at this time. Uh, and when we're ready, uh, let's move on. Uh, so it's in relatively uh, broad use, uh, a little bit under half, uh, have either, either race or rapid. Uh, and then there's a significant group that uses a variant and many organizations have one, by the way, uh, Wikipedia lists 14 or something like this. Uh, and 38% uh, do this more in an ad hoc way. And they probably have internal norms of how they go about setting roles and decision making. And so the key point I want to make is have you understand what we mean with the advocacy approval process and the roles in it, and that these traditional roles do not resolve the fatal flaws that come with the uh, advocacy approval process. Let me turn it to you, Jennifer. So, so we recognize that just defining roles isn't going to be enough, uh, something like RACI and RAPID, especially when we continue to rely on the advocacy approval approach. So the two things we need to think about here is we must insist to get to decision quality in all those important decisions, and we need designated roles to be responsible for that. You'll notice that in RACI and RAPID and those other variants, there is no role that's designed to actually judge the quality of a decision. So even if you have decision authority, if you don't know what it means to make a good decision, you can't, you can't make one. And we'll also touch on the fact that in order for roles and an appropriate process to be prescribed, we have to start with the diagnosis of the situation. So we've, uh, we know that in order to get to a quality decision, we have to meet six requirements. We have to have a clear understanding of the frame of the problem, what it is we're trying to solve. We need a good set of alternatives that can actually be each in their own right compelling in some way. We need the information to understand what we know and what we don't know in the context of those alternatives. We need good clarity about what we want, our values, and how we trade them off. So if we can combine what we can do, our creative alternatives, with what we know and don't know in terms of information and what we want in terms of our clear values, if we combine those things with sound reasoning and also work on commitment to action, we can get to the point that we are actually making a quality decision. And it's a, drawn as a chain because we know that a decision is no better than its weakest link. And in any process that we're doing in order to get decision quality, the whole point is to get to the point that we've got 100%. And here, 100% is not perfection. We don't know every piece of information we, we might want to know. We don't consider a thousand alternatives. We work on each of those dimensions until we've reached 100%, where we know that additional effort or delay on any one of those dimensions isn't worth it. We don't get enough additional quality to offset that investment. So that's what we want to ultimately achieve. And when we know that that's what we want, 
we can pretty quickly see how the advocacy approval process does not get us to the point of achieving decision quality. So Carl mentioned that there isn't a good uh, pre presentation of alternatives in a context of advocacy approval. We also are likely to carefully select the information we share about our recommend recommendation. So that bias shows up and it's about people competing instead of the alternatives themselves. And Jennifer, let me just add here, this may not be uh, in, in, intentional. This can be completely unconscious that people are being selective and bolstering. It's just part of what you have to do to make right. a recommendation withstand the interrogation. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's how, you, how you can be successful in that environment. Yeah. But what we'd like to do is change the environment so that we can actually get to decision quality. So the first thing we're gonna need is a process that creates a collaborative search for value as we work towards decision quality. Like before, we have two different groups. We have the decision board who's responsible for making the decisions. It might be one person, it might be a group of people. And then we have a project team that's actually responsible for doing the work to make proposals about what the frame might look like and the set of alternatives to be considered. They do the work to gather information and evaluate alternatives, but they don't do that all at once. Instead, the project team will first work on identifying a potential frame for the problem. Then they go back to the decision board to seek agreement on that, to make sure that, that they understand the problem the same way that the decision board does. And at that point, they're ready to develop alternatives that are compelling and creative and cover the range of possible choices. At this point, we actually see a clear transition from a competition between people, like the advocate and the decision makers, we're now having a competition between alternatives that each have their own level of value and interest. And once we can get into an evaluation of those alternatives, we can get real clarity on what decision is best and why. So that gives the decision makers a lot more confidence that they've gotten something that's actually gonna create maximum value. So we change the process, first of all, we have to, in conjunction with that, create two new roles. We need to design roles that have clear responsibility for meeting the requirements of DQ. The decision executive is going to be the leader of the decision board who has to have that line of sight to decision quality and recognize the value potential that's, that's on the line with, with this whole process of moving toward a competition of alternatives. And we also have a decision leader who is going to play the role of leading the decision team, the project team, and also engaging with the decision executive and the other decision board members so that a process can actually lead us decision quality. And so, one comment here, uh, Jennifer, uh, we were very impressed how at uh, Eli Lilly, they redefined decision quality requirements into decision rights. And they have a, a, a list of decision rights, which is basically the six elements of decision quality. And they say the decision executives and the decision board have the right to receive a frame that is of high quality or have the conversation. So from the top down, this uh, decision quality actually gives you a, a way of having that conversation around the right topics to get you to where you have uh, a sense of we've arrived at decision quality. All right. And it also, that whole structure also provides a lot of clarity for the project team on how to contribute to effective decision making because they know in the first phase of the effort we're working on what is the problem we're trying to solve. Then they get alignment there. I'm working with a client right now where getting agreement on the frame was a huge benefit for them before we even started to think about alternatives. It it kind of gave everybody a, a sigh of relief to say, oh, you mean we don't have to tackle everything at once? That's much more helpful. And we can do this a, a piece at a time. That really helped the, the project team as well. So we got a process that's going to that's gonna be helpful in getting to quality. As we think about the roles of the decision executive and the decision leader, there are key differences and both of those roles are really critical. 
First of all, we already noted the decision executive has to have line of sight to DQ and has to have clarity about the value potential that's being created in this process. He or she also has to know how to judge the quality of a decision at any point in time and be able to identify the gaps that have to be closed before the decision executive and the decision board can be aligned around the path forward. And it's also the decision executive's responsibility to ensure that, that appro appropriate engagement takes place with the various members of the decision board and that they have clarity about the quality of the decision at each point in time. And as soon as there is clarity that we've got the that we've got 100% on all those dimensions, the decision executive can move forward to actually begin execution because that's when it's time to go. The decision executive is also responsible for making sure that a decision record is created so that we can have lookbacks and learnings moving forward in that decision process. Uh, can I add something here too, Jennifer? Uh, this first item here, the line of sight to decision quality and value potential, the decision is just a means to get what people truly want, which is more of what, whatever it is, and that's what we call value. Uh, most recently in, in a, uh, an organization, I realized that the whole group of decision executives that they have doesn't have that visceral wish to maximize value. Winning is not defined as getting the most of what you could get in terms of a decision situation. Winning is getting my project approved. Winning is getting the capital to my region. Winning is getting the capital into my division. Okay? As opposed to sometimes winning in terms of more value would be to say, no, we shouldn't get the money it should be going somewhere else. That's a very hard thing to do. So yeah. a, a big piece of this is making sure that the decision executive and the decision boards are aligned with the true uh, value maximization of the organization overall. Getting this alignment, this agency problem that exists uh, universally in organizations is very fundamental. And so you have to have the decision review board truly aligned with the more with the thing you want most. Okay. Yes. And the decision leader is going to be able to support that in a variety of different ways. First of all, that decision leader also needs to share that line of sight to decision quality and the recognition that what we want to do is maximize value and not have it be a competition between people, whether it's advocates or whether it's the decision makers, we need to move toward that maximum value. The decision leader also has some very specific things that, that he or she has to do. And one of those key distinctions is working with the decision executive to diagnose the situation and prescribe an approach that fits the needs of the particular decision situation. We've described the dialogue decision process as having a few uh, separate steps, but in fact, that process needs to be tailored to the specific decision, way, decision situation. Sometimes we have to have multiple iterations on the evaluation. Sometimes we combine frame and alternatives if the problem is pretty clear. Lots of different refinements and it's the decision executive who has to bring the knowledge and experience to the problem to understand with the decision, um, the decision executives help, decision leader, I'm sorry, has to bring that expertise to describe the appropriate process. And then once that process and the key roles have been designated, then it's the decision leader who leads that process to build decision quality and gain alignment and also help the project team create the insights that are going to provide the clarity that's needed to get to commitment within the organization. And another dimension there is the creation of that decision record that enables an organization to learn from decision making as we go. We know we don't judge a decision by its outcome. Well, if that's the case, then we have to have a record by which we can judge decisions at the time we make them and as we look at them across various different decisions. And, and Jennifer, as organizations adopt decision quality as an organizational competence, this learning loop of being able to look back on decisions with hindsight is very important. But hindsight is, has so many biases built into it 
that <laughs> unless you create a good decision record at the time of decision, you will distort your learning process. Okay, so I, I think it's very fundamental to uh, for the decision leaders uh, to create together with the decision executive. Okay, making sure that we say, okay, so we've documented this decision and the elements of the decision. So when we look back in two years or four years or whatever the right time frame is for your organization, uh, that we can say we remember what we knew and what we didn't know. What was the uncertainty that we faced uh, at the time and mm -hmm. how did we make a decision in light of that uncertainty? You know, with hindsight, everybody knew that uh, Trump was going to get elected. <laughs> right, right. Well, and it's interesting too, that idea of creating a decision record and looking back is partly how a decision leader gains the perspective to help with diagnosis and design of an appropriate process. This is one of the first things a decision leader has to do. They have to figure out what is the true decision need. And there are many different dimensions of that, whether it's magnitude, is the decision something that's easily reversible, or is there a lot at stake, or whether it's values and trade-offs, is there a single value metric, or there are a lot of things that are interconnected and competing for attention. The decision leader needs to take a look and make a judgment about the particular context. In a situation like this one, analytical complexity is one of the, the steepest uh, ratings here, so that's gonna be a real focus in thinking about evaluation and information gathering and all those dimensions. Whereas if the nature of the problem is different, where the real challenges are the biases that are built into, that, that could end up being built into the decision, then the focus is more on how do we make sure we avoid the biases in the information assessments and in the, the set of alternatives that we generate, all those different pieces, the process will be tailored to match the specific need of the decision. And sometimes during that diagnosis, a decision leader might conclude that this is a, a pretty simple decision and can be made in the context of a couple of meetings. Or maybe it'll be at the other end of the spectrum where it requires the full dialogue decision pro uh, process engagement between the project team and the decision board. And that might take something like three months or even more depending on the complexity. Or it could be anywhere in between. Maybe it's a, a decision that can be tackled through a series of workshops or maybe a rapid DQ cycle that brings together the right people uh, for an intense period of time, maybe that is what can get us to decision quality. So there are a lot of different things and the decision leader is really gonna have responsibility for figuring out what's the right approach. But the definition uh, of decision quality doesn't change. So right. the destination is always getting to the point where you can say, uh, we've uh, got where it isn't worth doing more on those six requirements. Mm -hmm. So we have another uh, poll here, and the statement is your, our organization already uses the needed roles for decision quality and avoids advocacy slash approval as a process and your choices are strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. Uh, please send in your answers uh, and when we're ready here, we'll close the polls and see what the answers were. <laughs> okay, there are, we have something like 15, 14% of people that are already in the organizational decision quality world and have uh, adopted this. There are some in the middle, but uh, well over half are people that have not yet uh, begun to build organizational decision quality and begin to make this shift. Uh, it creates tremendous benefit when you can do it. And uh, I, I, we can talk about that at other times, but let me uh, summarize our, our points here. There were really two key points. And if we go to the next slide, I'll do it on that, okay? And uh, first is 
use a decision process that drives the decision quality instead of just a sale of one alternative and a recommendation. And we, we showed you the DDP, which is the full dialogue process. I think uh, you have to be uh, fit for purpose, and sometimes it's a very shortened version of it, but the destination is the same. You want to be able to reach a decision that meets the six requirements of decision quality. And the second point is somebody has to be in charge of that. Right? Now, uh, this reaching decision quality, by the way, is the core of what we teach in the required course of the SDRM program. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second required course is leading strategic decision making. And that is how you design, decide these roles and how do you lead effectively a, the process between a decision leader and a decision executive or decision board and uh, reach a high quality decision. So uh, the two key points that we wanted to make here is you, that the constant is decision quality. You gotta get there. And the second is the current advocacy approval process does not provide the right roles and responsibilities for doing that. That requires uh, identifying someone in the decision-making role, as what we call the decision executive here, to be the person that's the keeper with a line of sight to decision quality and value potential. So before it gets into approval, let's say we have something that's important enough that goes to for approval to the board of directors of a company or a higher level. And at that point, it's just an approval process. Then you need to have the decision quality process done before that because by the time it gets into the advocacy approval process, uh, it's too late. It, you can't inspect decision quality in. You have to build it in by having a competition among alternatives, and that requires the right roles. We've now prepared a couple of the questions that came in, so I'm gonna ask uh, Jennifer and Carl to respond. And the first question is, how can we influence senior leaders who may feel they have the sole right to make the decision and then facilitate junior staff to even bother to participate? So, so first of all, uh, senior leaders uh, that have the decision right uh, and responsibility, uh, uh, you, you want them to have it. It's more of a question of uh, how do they make that decision? Do they want to drive to decision quality? And how do they get, they get the, the, the quality of the input from the many people that will give them input. And there are many different styles, but I think uh, what Jennifer pointed out, the constant of all of this, if that senior leader understands decision quality, they're going to uh, demand it, okay? They're going to ask the right questions and the, the, the people that are bringing the input to that decision and helping that person with that are going to be very important. We often so find that it's, it's useful to start with one leader, one decision maker who understands the value of something like decision quality and not try to tackle the entire decision making body, but start with that one leader who has the insight that decision quality could really be helpful and then build outward from there. If you can take one big challenge for that decision maker that's that's facing something they, they can't really resolve, and you can apply the DQ approach there, then they can see the value of it and their colleagues can start recognizing that this is a different way to think about problems. And it doesn't take away the power of the decision makers. That's right. what, like what Carl was just mentioning. It's It doesn't disempower them. It just changes the way mm -hmm. they contribute to getting to that decision. It actually gives them more power. Yeah, it wonderful. takes away, but it does take away their power to make arbitrary decisions. Yes, <laughs> yes. And, and, and uh, in a way, uh, there are many people that are decision makers that like that. They don't want to be arbitrary. They would like to have uh, mm -hmm. the foundation. So for them, decision quality is a real solution. But I, I uh, was in a situation once where the chairman of a, a relatively large conglomerate uh, in Asia 
uh, had a personal two-day uh, decision quality course, uh, really loved it, got into it, uh, and only had some a couple of family members with them. And at the end of that, he says, I don't think I would like to adopt this for my organization. I would give up almost all my arbitrary power. <laughs> and and oh. arbitrary power <laughs> depend, you know, is, is valuable. It creates fear. It creates people being responsive. There are all kinds of things that go with it. It's not a simple uh, issue, but decision quality, if it's organizationally adopted, gives you lots more benefit. It gets you much more value. It's the best way to go, deliver more value for your stakeholders throughout. Right, becoming part of the culture of your organization. Yeah. Let's move to a second question. Um, how might crisis decision-making, as in the case with our falling global economy, change how we should think about decision roles and processes? Well, this is especially timely right now. Uh, but let me say, uh, crisis decision making is a topic in its own, okay? And you have to divide it into uh, decision making where it's truly in the moment. Like I've participated in a number of panels and had a recent uh, webcast that if people are interested, they can Google Eric uh, J. McNulty. He, he, he uh, runs a, a crisis decision making uh, center. But there you, you start saying things like shooter on floor nine. Now what do you do, okay? And uh, police chiefs and mayors and everybody else around the panel is saying, what do we do? But that's a very different decision from uh, hearing that uh, we have the coronavirus outbreak and it might become a pandemic where I now have to, what I call rapid DQ, the kind of processes we talked about here, fit you just have to get them done in a day or two okay but you don't have to do it in an in an instant when you have right. to do things on an in an instant then you have to be able to be on automatic that means you have to have trained and trained and simulated like pilot pilots and the marines and so on that kind of uh, crisis decision making has to be really in your muscle memory to be able to be the best at it. And there's another dimension of this too. Oftentimes we think about crises as situations where we have things we have to react to immediately and change what we're doing. Crises and other things like that often create opportunities for organizations that have the perspective that yes, something is happening now and that's gonna change. We know it's gonna evolve to something different. If we can think well about the bigger picture and have good solid decision processes in place that, that are focused on decision quality, we can actually see some of these crises as opportunities. Like mm -hmm. if, you, uh, if, you can, if your organization benefits from being able to do more work remotely, then something like the current situation would be a boom for you as opposed to a big problem. You're going to be forced to learn some new skills. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, uh, you may sometimes. find that after you learn those new skills, uh, you, you're more effective and you should be working differently. Right. We, might, we may wonder why we weren't doing those all along. So it's interesting. Yeah. I'm going to squeeze in one more question because it's a really good one. I want to make sure we get to it. Does the decision leader need to have deep technical skills as well as strong soft skills? Ah, yes, that's an interesting question. So a decision leader, as you saw, has to be able to help build alignment and get the process, keep the process moving, make sure we're getting to decision quality. But they also have to be responsible for helping to generate those insights that really help differentiate one alternative over another. And sometimes that's done with the decision leader who has a lot of technical skills. But another way to do it is to have a team that includes the expertise of really strong analytical staff members who can actually provide the tools that you need. As a decision leader, you need to know how to ask the right kinds of questions, but you may be able to leverage your teammates. Even if you have mm -hmm. those skills, you'll ultimately want to leverage your teammates to get to the answers. So it's more important that you have the insights rather than have all the detailed technical skills for how to build a, a, a sophisticated Excel simulation model. 
Wonderful. A lot of us are glad to know that we don't have to have all of those skills. It's good to surround us with people who do. That's but, <laughs> You do have to use them. It's, it's, right. you have to agree. So the, 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 I, I think in what Jennifer said is the decision leader has to appreciate them and ask for them and reach out for them. It's the That's the, the right. end product of those mm -hmm. skills. They, right. you, you don't always have all the, sk the skills in the same person, but yeah. Right. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you again, Jennifer and Carl, for spending your time here with us today in this webinar. Thanks to all of you out there that were spending your time and energy here with us today. Once yeah. you leave today's webinar, you will be directed to a survey on the presentation. We would appreciate that you do complete that for us. And you'll also receive a follow-up email and a link to the recording in a couple of days so that you can re-watch, rethink about it, um, and bring this back to your organization. Thank you very much on behalf of SDG and Texas Executive Education. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time.